mean, one thing that uh, I found was very was very useful in in what you presented was uh, the relationship of social science and social technology, and the significance of the intervening factor of ideology, which. Uh, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's like a very powerful filter that will only turn insights into technology that, that suit a preconceived conception, even if that conception is, is completely undermined by science. Yeah. And by the insights of... There's a very interesting example, which is not very well known. That was the International Monetary Fund. The International Monetary Fund in Washington has two basic departments. One is a research department, and the other is a policy department. The research department is very good, very high level. A number of people who subsequently got the work projects, Tignitz, have been working there. They get good data. <clears throat> and uh, they got they built interesting uh, research on trends, for instance, the effects of the so-called liberalization uh, on on the emerging economies and so on. But then the policy department, which is ideological, pays no attention whatsoever to the findings of the research. For instance, the research department finds that liberalization has been a disaster, has ruined most of the industrial industries in the Latin America. But then the policy department insists on the neoliberal uh, point of view, which is, <coughs> as you know, was proclaimed from high up by Reagan and by Clinton and by the two Bushes and so on that um, free, free trade is the solution to all the possible uh, social ills. And uh, regardless of what the research department <coughs> So in a reasonable, in a well-organized society, our uh, ideology is, and science uh, should come together, the ideology should use make use of the findings of, of, of the scientists, and the scientists should look at the sociology of uh, to see what are the uh, problems of interest people <laughs> and what are the, for instance, the political currents that either favor or block. But in a way, in a, in a strange way, that's what is happening. Many economists look at the ideo ideologues and the politicians and say, well, what do they, what do they want? And then they supply basically uh, justifications, rationalizations with the veneer of science for what they want to do for ideological reasons. So that's a coming together as well, but it's more of the kind that science and ideology came together in Marxism and Leninism, you know, where the science was... <laughs> subordinate to the parties. It's interesting. Higher purposes. Also interesting. Now, the first Reagan presidency, uh, Reagan did not cut the budget of basic science, but made huge cuts in the social sciences. Because the conservatives are not interested in the uh, people get to know what's happening in their societies. Uh, because that might be, might be, the <coughs> fighting might be very dangerous. For instance, it is well known that over the past 30 or 40 years, the Gini index that measures the income inequality had been rising from 0.3 to 0.45 in the States and in Canada also. Likewise. And this increase in inequality goes against the myth of American equality, the, the myth concocted by no less than Alexis de Fabry, because he emphasized the 
It quite in a movie. He didn't. He didn't see this. Who was that? Alexis, it's not me. <laughs>